وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته all praise is due to Allah alone. We ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to his family and his companions. We're talking about the rights of the husband, the rights of the wife. We've talked about the rights in which there are general equivalents. And we're also talking about the rights that are rights of the husband. We've talked about the obligation of the husband to spend upon his wife, to provide accommodation for his wife, the obligation of the mahar. Uh, and these are some of the major obligations that the husband has to take, we've talked about the obligation of providing food and clothing and issues relating to around spending, equality in spending between co-wives and so on. We're now gonna come to some of the obligations of the wife. And we're gonna start by talking about how serious the wife's obligations are. We spoke about how serious the nafaqa of the husband, the spending of the husband, how serious that infaq, that spending is. We're now gonna talk about how serious the obligations of the wife are. عن عائشة رضي الله عنها أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لو أمرت أحدا أن يسجد لأحد لأمرت المرأة أن تسجد لزوجها The Prophet said if I was going to command someone to prostrate before I eat, to bow before someone I would have commanded a woman to bow before her husband That's one of the the ahadith on this topic, and we're going to cover quite a few different wordings of this hadith and different ahadith or different different versions of it. So here we talk about the seriousness of a woman fulfilling her husband's obligations and the importance of obedience to the husband. Since the husband has been set up as the head of the family, Allah Azawajal said, "Arrijalu qawwa muna ala nisa." Men have a degree of responsibility over women because of what Allah has preferred some of them over others and because of what they spend out of their wealth. In response to that, a woman has to respect that qawwama, that responsibility that her husband has, and she has to obey him. And we've spoken already about obedience, and we've spoken about the great rewards of obedience, that if a woman obeys her husband, prays her prayers, fasts her Ramadan, keeps herself chaste, and obeys her husband, it will be said to her, Yawm Qiyamah, enter from whichever the doors of paradise you wish. Regardless of what her husband asks her to do, if he's not asking her to do something forbidden, then she must do what she's told. However, when it comes to doing what you're told, and we're going to come to this inshallah, we talk about the parents as well. Doing what you're told, we're going to talk about two aspects of it. The first is, there is no obedience to creation in disobedience to the Creator. لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق there is no obedience to creation in disobedience to the Creator. So the husband says to his wife, take off your hijab. The husband says to his wife uh, that you uh, do go out uh, with uh, you know, adornment, makeup or whatever. The husband says to his wife, don't pray. The husband says to his wife, don't fast Ramadan. لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق there is no obedience to creation in disobedience to the Creator. But if she has to disobey her husband because he's asking her to do something haram, she should disobey him in the best possible way, i.e. with the best of manners, the kindest of manners and the best of character because we said this is part of the ma'roof that the husband and the wife are commanded to live to, together with the best of manners, the best of character. So if she has to disobey him in something because he asked her to do something haram, then she does it in the best possible way. And that's the same with the child towards their parent. And it's the same of the husband towards uh, the Muslim ruler, for example, that if you're going to disobey someone because they asked you to do something haram, you've got to do it in the best and the kindest possible way. Also, if the husband asks her to do something which is unreasonably unreasonable or harmful to her. So he asks her to do something which is harmful um, and brings about harm upon her then she doesn't have to obey him in this, but again, she has to do this according to al-ma'roof, according to what is good. And this is an area where she should seek 
consultation from the people of knowledge because it's difficult to give a single answer. There are many different situations. She might feel it's harmful, but the husband might be justified. So it's better that she should ask from the people of knowledge to understand this particular issue. But generally speaking, she obeys her husband unless he asks her to do something haram or something which brings upon her considerable harm, which is unreasonable within the, the limits of what is customary and so on and what is within the limits of the Sharia. Continuing on from this, we come to a hadith and this hadith is in Sunan ibn Majah and others. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَّتِهِ لَا تُؤَدِّي الْمَرْأَةُ حَقَّ رَبِّهَا حَتَّى تُؤَدِّيَ حَقَّ زَوْجِهَا وَلَوْ سَأَلَهَا نَفْسَهَا وَهِيَ أَلَى قَتَبْ لَمْ تَمْنَعْهُ He said, by the one that the soul of Muhammad is in his hands, I in that by Allah, a woman does not fulfill the rights of her Lord until she fulfilled the rights of her husband. And if he asked her for herself, I asked her for intimacy, while she was in the saddle, she would not prevent him from that. And that means that she's in a, it's very inconvenient, and yani she's saddled up riding the camel or whatever, you know, and he then asks her for intimacy. She then has to get down to make herself available uh, for her husband. And that is one of the major obligations of a woman over a husband. And some of the scholars, they put it in opposition or in contrast to an nafaqa, to the husband spending upon her. And that is the right to intimacy. However, in reality, there is an element of the right to intimacy which is bil mumathala, which is equivalent. And this is evidence from a number of points of view. First of all, the fact that ghaddul basar and sufficing yourself and lowering your gaze is an obligation upon both the husband and the wife. So the fact that lowering the gaze is an obligation upon the husband and the wife and protecting the chastity is an obligation upon the husband and the wife. Therefore, fulfilling desires of the husband and the wife is an equivalent obligation to an extent. However, where it becomes specific to the man is the immediacy, the right to immediate uh, intimacy or immediate satisfaction uh, as, of, of intimate uh, desires, that that needs to be with regard to the man. There is an immediacy, there is an urgency that isn't mentioned with regard to the woman, even though it is still from her rights. And Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, mentioned it from the greatest of the rights that the woman has that her husband fulfills her needs in a, of an intimate nature. But here, uh, th this emphasizes the immediacy with regard to the husband. And that is uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the scholars, they say that this is the husband's right when he is spending upon his wife, when he has paid the mahar, that he has done so on the understanding that she will be available for him in, in terms of intimacy. And he has that understanding, it's part of the act, it's part of the contract. And we define the contract as being a contract which makes intimacy between the two parties permissible in the way that the Sharia has legislated it. So if that's the very definition of Aqtun Nikah, then ultimately it has to be a major part of the understanding between husband and wife. So here she's not allowed to prevent him from that. And also the nature of men is typically different. A man, if he isn't uh, satisfied in that way and isn't given that right, then it may be that it leads him to looking elsewhere. It may be that it leads him to something that will go back to that woman and bring harm to her, like her reputation and her honor, because he isn't able to control himself. So a man's needs are somewhat different in that regard. So we're going to say that if we look at it one way, intimacy is a shared right and it's equivalent because both husband and wife have the right to intimacy in general. But in terms of immediacy and intimacy, like as in it being an immediate need, then this is a right of the husband in response to the wealth that he spends upon his wife and the mahab that he has given to her. Likewise, in the narration of 
uh, this hadith in Abi Dawood and the hadith, this particular hadith narrated from Mu'adh ibn Jabal that the Prophet وسلم, said لو كنت آمرا أحدا أن يسجد لأحد لأمرت النساء أن يسجدن لأزواجهن لما جعل الله لهم عليهن من الحق The Prophet وسلم, said if I was to command anyone to prostrate before anyone I would have commanded women to prostrate before their husbands because of the rights that Allah has given their husbands over them. And in the hadith of Anas, that the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يصلح لبشر أن يسجد لبشر It's not right for a man or a person to prostrate before another person. وَلَوْ صَلَحَ لِبَشَرٍ أَنْ يَسْجُدَ لِبَشَرٍ لَأَمَرْتُ الْمَرْأَةِ أَنْ تَسْجُدَ لِزَوْجِهَا مِنْ عِظَمِ حَقِّهِ عَلَيْهَا He said that, if it was right for a person to prostrate before another person, I would have commanded a woman to prostrate before a husband because of the greatness of the right that he has over her. Likewise, in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ explained in even more detail, Ten bejis bil sadid مَا أَدَّتْ The Prophet ﷺ said, By the one whose hand my soul is in, if there was from the man's feet to the crown of his head an ulcer that was spilling out blood and pus, and then she came and she faced him and she licked it off, she would not have given him his right. She would not have given him all of his rights. And that is really explains the, the severity and the seriousness of the right of the husband and the obligation of the wife towards the husband. The Prophet ﷺ explained with such emphasis that if he had an ulcer that was bleeding with blood and pus from his head to his foot and she licked it, it she would not have fulfilled the right that he had over her. So the rights are very, very important to take it seriously and for her to strive to fulfill, to learn what those rights are and to fulfill those rights. And Abdullah bin Amr narrated from the Prophet وسلم, that he said, لا ينظر الله إلى امرأة لا تشكر لزوجها وهي لا تستغني عن. Allah does not look at a woman who doesn't thank her husband or show gratitude to her husband even though she cannot live without him or she can't manage without him. Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't look at, he doesn't, there's no benefit for that woman. That, that, that Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't look at her. There's no good for her. If she doesn't show gratitude to her husband, even though she should recognize that, she can't manage without him. These are all authentic ahadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَعَنْ أَسْمَاءِ بِنَةَ يَزِيدَ الْأَنْصَارِيَةِ قالت مر بي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنا في جوار أتراب لي أسماء بنت أزيد الأنصارية she said the Prophet صلى passed by me and I was with a group of uh, of girls that were of a similar age to me the hadith is in al-Bukhari and al-Adab and she said فسلم علينا he gave salam to us وقال أي وقال إياكن وَكُفْرُ الْمُنْعِمِينَ He said, keep away from ingratitude towards the one who gives you goodness. She said, وَكُنْتُ مِنْ أَجْرَائِهِنَّ عَلَى مَسْأَلَتِهِ She said, I was one of the most brave to ask him questions. فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ I said, O Messenger of Allah, وَمَا كُفْرُ الْمُنْعِمِينَ What does it mean to be ungrateful towards the one who gives you goodness? قَالَ لَعَلَّ إِحْدَى كُنَّ تَطُولُ أَيْمَتُهَا مِنْ أَبَوَيْهَا ثُمَّ يَرْزُقُهَا اللَّهُ زَوْجًا وَيَرْزُقُهَا مِنْهُ وَلَدًا فَتَغْضَبُ الْغَضْبَةِ فَتَغْضَبُ الْغَضْبَةِ فَتَكْفُرُ فَتَقُولْ مَا رَأَيْتُ مِنْكَ خَيْرًا قط. He said, perhaps one of you women will be single for a long time with her parents, living with her parents. She'll not be married. Then Allah will give her a husband and from her husband will give her children. So she gets angry with a bit of anger one day 
and she's ungrateful and she says, I never saw any good from you. We have already spoken about this from a different angle when I emphasize that one of the rights is that she should not be ungrateful towards her husband and one of her obligations is gratitude towards him and that she never uses these words like never, I never saw any good from you or I never knew any good from you or you never did anything good for me and words that are equivalent uh, to this. وعن الحسين بن محصن أن عمة له أتت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في حاجة ففرقت من حاجتها فقال لها النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أذات زوج أنت قالت نعم قال وكيف أنت له So Al-Husayn ibn Muhsan narrates that a paternal aunt of his came to the Prophet ﷺ for a need. And when he finished with that need that she had, he said to her, are you married? Are you? Do you have a husband? She said, yes. He said, how are you towards him? And the hadith is narrated by Imam Ahmed and Al-Hakib. Qalat ma alu. She said, I am not, I try not to be deficient towards him in his rights. Illa ma ajastu an, except if I'm unable to do it. Qala fanzuri ayna anti minhu fa inna ma huwa jannatuka wa nar. He said, she said, I try not to fall short in any of his rights. The Prophet ﷺ said, and she said, except what I for, what I can't do. And I put this hadith because I felt that it's a really nice explanation of how she coped with this huge responsibility of the husband. You know, all these hadith we heard about this weighty responsibility, and we've heard on both sides. They took from you a heavy oath. And we've heard the right of the, of the husband over the wife and that the Prophet ﷺ said that I wouldn't have commanded anyone to prostrate to anyone, but if I did, I would have said for a woman to prostrate to a husband. How did the women cope with this? She explains it beautifully. She said, I try my best not to fall short in the way that I deal with him. Except if I'm just unable. Ajizah. I couldn't do it. I did my best. Sometimes I couldn't do it. He said, look at how you are with your husband. For your husband, he is your Jannah or your Nar. He is your paradise or he is your hellfire. And that we have mentioned already in the hadith that if a woman prays her five daily prayers and fasts a month of Ramadan, guards her chastity and obeys her husband, it will be said to her, enter from whichever the doors of Jannah you wish. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Ala ukhbirukum bi rijalikum fil jannah." Shall I not inform you of your men in paradise? And nabiyu fil jannah, the prophets are in jannah. Was siddiqu fil jannah, and the siddiq, the truthful one, is in jannah. Was shahidu fil jannah, and the martyr is in jannah. Wal mauludu fil jannah, and the child that dies before puberty is in jannah. Wal rajulu yazuru akhahu fi nahiyat al Misr. لا يزوره إلا لله في الجنة and a man visits his brother in the far side of the city and he only visits him for Allah he is in Jannah then the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said ألا أخبركم بنسائكم في الجنة كل ودود ولود shall I not inform you of your women in paradise everyone who is loving and bears many children إذا غضبت أو أسيء إليها أو غضب زوجها if she gets angry or that she something she is a bad is done to her or her husband gets angry with her qalat hadhihi yadi fi yadik she says this is my hand in your hand la aktahilu bi ghamdin hatta tarda my eyes are not going to close to sleep until you're happy with me the hadith in tabarani and Nasa'i in Sunan Al-Kubara from the hadith of Anas ibn Abbas and Ka'ab ibn Ujra. This hadith is a powerful hadith, a powerful hadith that the woman described as being the women of the people of Jannah. She, she gets angry or her husband gets angry or things don't work out the way they're supposed to. She puts her hand in her husband's hand and she says, my eyes are not going to sleep 
until you're happy with me. And what a beautiful etiquette that is, and what an example of the responsibility and the obligation of the wife towards the husband. And that's why we put it in that particular in that particular place in our discussion so far. Another beautiful example of how really to make this work, to make these responsibilities work, because we don't want to make people feel like it's a burden they can't bear. Allah doesn't burden a person with what they can't bear. Is that our mother Aisha, she said, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِنِّي لَأَعْلَمُ إِذَا كُنْتِ عَنِّي رَاضِيَةً وَإِذَا كُنْتِ عَنْ وَإِذَا كُنْتِ عَلَيَّ غَضْبَةً He said, I know when you're angry, with, when you're happy with me, and I know when you're angry with me. قَالَتْ فَقُلْتُ مِنْ أَيْنَ تَعْرِفُ ذَلِكَ She said, I said to him, how do you know this? فَقَالْ أَمَا إِذَا كُنْتِ عَنِّي رَاضِيَةً فَإِنَّكِ تَقُولِينَ لَا وَرَبِّ مُحَمَّدْ He said, when you're happy with me, you say, I swear by the Lord of Muhammad. And she swears by Allah. But she says it in the way, I swear by the Lord of Muhammad, when she's happy with the Prophet وَإِذَا كُنْتِ عَلَيَّ غَضْبًا قُلْتِ لَا وَرَبِّ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ And if you're upset with me, you say, by the Lord of Ibrahim. قَالَتْ قُلْتُ أَجَلْ وَاللَّهِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَا أَهْجُرُ إِلَّا اسمك. She said, indeed that's true by Allah or Messenger of Allah, but I don't leave anything except your name. Look at the beautiful way that Aisha managed this huge responsibility. Now remember, Aisha has much more responsibility than an, than an ordinary wife because her husband is a prophet. So she has a responsibility of a wife to a husband and a responsibility of a follower to a prophet. So it's a very serious responsibility. This hadith in Bukhari, a Muslim, it's very serious. But here, look at how she says that when she gets angry, she doesn't shout or say anything bad or upset the Prophet ﷺ. Just he can tell from the fact that she doesn't say by the Lord of Muhammad, but she says by the Lord of Ibrahim. And she said, the only thing I left was your name. I didn't want to make you angry or say anything to make you angry, but just I... I didn't mention your name, that was all. And the Prophet ﷺ, look how beautifully he took it and how beautifully he managed that situation with Aisha and how each knew about the other when they were upset and how each one managed that and how Aisha took on the rights of the wife and fulfilled those rights and the rights of a someone who, of course, her husband as the Prophet ﷺ, she has to also follow him as a prophet and as a guide and a teacher as well as as a husband and how she joined between those rights. So I wanted to bring this to show you that these rights are not impossible to fulfill. And nobody should hear these rights and feel like it's not possible or it's not, it's, it's not doable for a woman to fulfill them. Rather, it is doable and it is possible, just like it's possible for a husband to fulfill the obligations that he has over his wife. But it requires that beautiful living together where Ashiru Hunna Bil Ma'roof live together with them in the most beautiful way. And it requires that mawadda and that rahma and forgiveness and love and care that is required from both sides for these weighty rights of the husband and wife to be able to be fulfilled. وعن معاذ بن جبل رضي الله عن عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال لا تؤذي امرأة زوجها في الدنيا إلا قالت زوجته من الحور العين لا تؤذيه قاتلك الله فإنما هو عندك دخيل يوشك أن يفارقك إلينا الحديث عن الترمذي بن ماجة المسنى الإمام أحمد from the hadith of Mu'adh bin Jabal, the Prophet ﷺ said, let not a woman upset her husband or harm her husband in the dunya. Whenever she say, if she does this, then his wife from the Hur al from the women of Jannah, she says, don't upset him. May Allah fight you. For he's only with you for a time, a temporary time, temporarily. And he is about to leave you to come to us. And this hadith tells one of the, 
the the uh, the warnings and and the instruction to the wife to tell her not to harm upset her husband and not to harm her husband and that is one of the obligations that is upon her and to understand that if she does so then this is only going to raise his rank and only going to cause the hur al ain from the women of jannah to say to make a dua against that woman and to remind her that he's only going to be with her for a short time this also it talks about the severity of the obligations and the importance that she doesn't harm her husband and she doesn't upset her husband. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, إثناني لا لا تجاوز صلاتهما رؤوسهما عبد آبق من مواليه حتى يرجع وامرأة عصت زوجها حتى ترجع. The Prophet ﷺ said, two people, their prayer does not reach above their head. A servant who runs away from a slave who runs away from his master until he returns, and a woman who disobeys her husband until she returns to obeying her husband. And this is a further emphasis for the obligation of obedience. And in Bukhari and Muslim from the hadith of Abi Huraira radiallahu an, وَقَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِذَا دَعَ الرَّجُلُ مْرَأَتَهُ إِلَى فِرَاشِهِ فَأَبَتْ فَبَاتَ غَضْبًا عَلَيْهَا Abi Huraira narrates the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, If a man calls his wife to bed and she refuses, I for intimacy, she refuses, and he goes to sleep up, angry with her, the angels curse her until the morning comes, and in other narrations, until her husband is happy with her. So we can take from this the right of intimacy. We had spoken about it briefly, we had said there's a degree of equivalence in the right of intimacy but that the immediacy of it is a right which is for the husband. And in Sahih Muslim from the hadith of Abi Huraira radiallahu an, qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ مَا مِنْ رَجُلٍ يَدْعُ مْرَأَتَهُ إِلَى فِرَاشِهَا فَتَأْبَى عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا كَانَ الَّذِي فِي السَّمَاءِ سَاخِطًا عَلَيْهَا حَتَّى يَرْضَى عَنْهَا the Prophet ﷺ said, By the one whose hand my soul is in. There is no man who calls his wife to her bed and she refuses him, except that the one in the heavens is angry with her until her husband is pleased with her. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. But having said that, we also need to bear in mind, on the other side, a hadith in Muslim from Abi Sa'id al-Khudri. يَقُولُ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِنَّ مِنْ أَشَرِّ إِنَّ مِنْ أَشَرِّ النَّاسِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مَنْزِلَةً يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ الرَّجُلُ الرَّجُلُ يُفْطِي إِلَى امْرَأَتِهِ وَتُفْضِي إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ يَنْشُرُ سِرَّهَا He said from the worst of the people in the sight of Allah in position on the Day of Judgment is a man who goes to his wife and she goes to him in intimacy then he spreads her secrets so from the obligations which counterbalances the obligation of immediate intimacy from the wife towards the husband is that the husband has the obligation of keeping what happens between them in the bedroom quiet and private and not spreading that to anyone. And that is also an equivalent obligation as it regards to the wife. That's why the Prophet said a man who goes to his wife and his wife goes to him. And it's not allowed for him to spread any of the private things that happen between them in terms of intimacy. So that's kind of a counterbalance uh, to that. And in addition to this, from the obligations, is that which narrated by Abi Huraira, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يحل لمرأة أن تصوم وزوجها شاهد إلا بإذنه ولا تأذن في بيته إلا بإذنه متفق عليه that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said it's not allowed for a woman to fast while her husband is present except with his permission, i.e. in case of his need of intimacy, nor to allow someone to come into his house except with his permission, and the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. So very important here that even when it comes to fasting, that is the voluntary fasting or the making up of the fast, that she delays that or she seeks her husband's permission in that in case he has the need of that immediate need, the immediate obligation for intimacy as we had mentioned earlier. That's all we have time for in this session where we've looked at some of the major obligations 
uh, upon the, the wife as it relates to obligations she has towards her husband, as we had looked at the ones from the husband previously. That's what Allah made easy for us to mention, and Allah Azza wa Jalla's best. Wa salatu wa salam ala bin Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amauathome.com.